Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Coleman. I teach a course called Value Creation, which teaches you how to make tons of money. And I taught Gal Gadot, so everything she knows about technology, I taught her. And if we think about how we can generate value, I think the most vulgar way is to look at this website. It's a website called Finviz, Financial Visualization, which shows the value of the major companies on the US stock market. So on the left-hand side, we see the technology sector. So we see Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Intel, IBM, Cisco, etc., where the size indicates uh, how much money you need to bring if you want to buy Facebook. And the color indicates what happened to their stock right now. I mean, Facebook rose, if it's green, it rose by 0.45%. By and the other companies, the red ones, lost value. This is the financial sector. So you can see Visa, MasterCard, American Express, PayPal, Bank of America, JP Morgan. And these two sectors used to live happily. Uh, and now we're going to see a nice massacre, uh, in the nice sense of the word massacre, in the sense that the technology sector is going to slaughter the financial sector. Uh, the word is basically fintech. We all know the story about the kid who got 10 bitcoins for his birthday, and today is a multimillionaire and doesn't remember who, were his, who his parents were. So this is just, in a nutshell, what's going to happen. So uh, if until today we had brokers who would, buy, uh, who would manage our portfolio, buy and sell stock based on their intuition, today we're talking about algo trading, where an algorithm is doing a much better job, and people became billionaires by, by uh, developing algo trading. Uh, much of the financial sector is going to be annihilated by peer-to-peer -peer loans, things of the sort. Services. Historically, people were rich because they had land in biblical times. Then there was the Industrial Revolution. People were rich because they manufactured things. Today, most of us are in the services sector. So here we see Disney, Amazon, and Walmart. Amazon and Walmart are two companies that historically had no competition. Uh, Walmart, the world's largest uh, retail uh, supermarket chain, um, if you want to buy chicken, peas, you go to Walmart. Amazon, um, if you want to buy books, electronics, you go to Amazon. So there's no competition, but two dramatic things happened recently. Amazon acquired Whole Foods, which is a supermarket chain. And the idea is that if you want to buy chicken, you can go to Amazon as well. And Amazon launched a, uh, a cashierless supermarket, where you, where, which is uh, filled with cameras. And they realize what you, what you take and what you return to the shelf. Uh, and so as a result, you do not have cashiers. And in the battle between the two, I think most of us bet on Amazon. Uh, Amazon had those fantastic hol holidays, you know, Black Friday, Monkey Monday, Stupid Sunday, which turned Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, to the richest person in the planet, except Putin. It's always safe to say, except Putin. So I think most of us bet that Amazon would win the war. Consumer goods. Here we also see something surprising. Apple. Apple used to be the dwarf in the shadow of Microsoft, this tiny company in the shadow of IBM. Today's a company with the, largest, with the highest value, nine, $900 billion, going towards a trillion. So they left the technology sector for the consumer goods, where they are together with Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Procter & Gamble, Nike, the cigarette companies. And just to realize the, the decline of manufacturing sector, Ford and General Motors are two tiny dwarfs in, in the Apple uh, value. This is healthcare. So here you see pharmaceutical companies and companies that make uh, devices such as pacemakers, etc. And here you see the, the aeronautics sector. So you see General Electric, Boeing, United Technologies, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, General Dynamic, etc. And still, all these giants are much, much smaller than Apple put together. So when I think about, about a startup, and I need to understand the arena that I'm going to, uh, to operate in, I need to, I need to learn what goes on there. And we actually have, so, so, so for that reason, we want to draw the arena. I use this as a metaphor, which looks at the business arena. And the height indicates how attractive it is to me. Now, something that could be attractive to me, if I have background in pharmaceuticals, might not be attractive to somebody else who has background in financial services. So I'm looking for areas that are attractive. Attractive means it's easy for me to enter. 
if I think about pharmaceuticals and I need to get FDA clearance, we're talking about millions of dollars and, and dozens of years getting FDA approval. So that's hard. So I'm looking for things that are easy and profitable, OK? Uh, just to show you that I'm not the first to come up with this idea, this is a drawing by Walt Disney. And Walt Disney outlines his vision. So he starts with making theatrical films that make a lot of money. But that's not enough. He also wants to, to leverage the films to have TV channels. Music, I think on Broadway right now, we have something like three uh, musicals which were derived from, from Disney movies. Uh, and Disneyland. So in Disneyland, so if you, if you saw uh, Lion King, then in Disneyland, you'd have the Lion King area. And of course, merchandise. If you saw, if you saw a movie, of course, you, you, you must buy a, a Elsa t-shirt or all this junk that Disney is so great at pushing. So this is the vision that Disney has. And the fact that it's visual is very significant for several reasons. One reason, I need to communicate. So the people in my team need to understand what my vision is. They need to explain to me why I'm a clown, why I'm making so many mistakes. So, so, so we need to have a debate. And on a visual platform, it's much easier to debate. If, I, if we want to navigate and I say, let's take this road, and, and he says, let's take another road, it's very easy to see the conflict, and it's much more, much more easy to resolve it. The other thing, when we look at something visually, uh, we use the, the creative part of the head, the, of the brain, that's the, the part that's, that's user, that looks at visual images, and that's the creative part. So we want to be creative, and we want everybody in our team to understand it. And finally, if you have a product and we want to raise money, it's, and you think about a roadshow where you have people with money and uh, there's a parade of clowns asking for money, then it's important for me to be able to very quickly convey how I create value and to be remembered. Okay, because in a parade of many, many, many companies, I want to show you in two, in, in two seconds what my model is. This is, um, this is uh, from Bloomberg. They talk about the fact that America is giving away the $30 billion medical marijuana industry. And one of the countries that are, that are cashing on that is Israel. So a project that we worked on was medical marijuana. And... So when you ask yourself, so I want to get into the medical marijuana arena, you need to understand what goes on there. And one of the things that I like to do is recognize successful business models and steal them for my purposes and adapt them to my needs. So this is the, the, <coughs> Nestle, the Nestle capsule arena. So if you think about Nestle, Nestle was buy, would buy coffee from planters, would, would make say Nescafe, and sell it through supermarkets, right? That was the basic model. Once they moved into the Nespresso model, several things had to change. One thing, they needed to have a machine. So they needed somebody to design a machine, needed somebody to manufacture the machine, they needed somebody to maintain it, so if it breaks or whatever. They needed to design and manufacture the capsules, and also they have something that was not in the past, which is a store. So in many, many places, right, we see these Nespresso stores that sell all these capsules. So if you're thinking about medical marijuana, the analogy is very similar. Because if somebody uh, is, um, I, I know this lady, she, she was in a very severe road accident, and she's smoking medical marijuana. You don't want to smoke it and have your kids just rush around the carpet somewhere inside this huge cloud of marijuana smoke. So why would this uh, model be relevant for us? Because in marijuana, as with Nespresso, you have different types of plants. Uh, you have uppers and downers, etc. So it makes sense that some people would want to use one type of marijuana, others would like to use another type. And also the idea is that you have this capsule. So what we did in, in that case, we had a, um, uh, a capsule similar to that with oil uh, in which the, the marijuana was, was impregnated. And you put it into a, into a machine which is much simpler than that. And as a result, you get a tiny uh, capsule with marijuana vapor in it. And uh, for instance, uh, people who have lung cancer and they cannot inhale, they have a, a big ball, like a, a, a Pilates ball, which is filled with marijuana vapor. And they hold it and they can press it so that they, get, that they inhale the marijuana. So again, the point is you look at the model. Uh, and you say, well, this model is relevant to me. How can I, how can I uh, take advantage of it? Uh, this is uh, 
This is Alibaba. This was the world's largest initial public offering in the history of this planet. And again, he draws the arena to explain his, his raison d'etre. So he says, there are wholesales, there are companies that manufacture things in China and outside of China, US, India. Uh, you have people who want to buy it, and he basically says, I'm going to be a platform, Alibaba, etc. And he has a whole set of, of images, plus, of course, Alipay, uh, which is a very significant um, um, mechanism for paying for products. Um, this, is, this is a sad story. This is uh, uh, Renault's investment in uh, Better Place, the, the concept of an electric car. So if you think about an electric car, they show the arena, and they show what's different in this arena from the arena that we're used to. And we see two differences. One difference, I mean, the car is the same, but the battery is leased because when I stop in a station, I, I, the station basically takes my current battery and gives me another one, so the battery does not belong to me. I'm just leasing a battery. So this is one variation, and the other is the question where I buy the electricity from. So I could buy the electricity from Better Place, from the electrical utility, from Joe's electric, electric supplies. And so here they see four models. So that's basically the point, to see models in the arena or to see templates. And to, and to reach a, a, a reasonable decision, here they talk about Israel. Israel is attractive for several reasons. One of them is the fact that Israel is a small country. So, you, so it's relatively easy to cover Israel with uh, replacement stations. And another important thing, I'll talk about control in the arena. The regulator in Israel says that internal combustion engine cars will bear 62% more taxes than electric vehicle. This is very important because the electric vehicle is expensive. And the fact that, that I have a 62% tax uh, benefit is very significant when I want to sell the car to you at reasonable prices. Um, and another thing, so that I showed you politicians, but this is also the regulatory aspect of it. International Standard Organization, all these associations that have standards about plugs, sockets, etc. So if I want to go into this arena, I cannot just go in. I, I need to, to start and understand who is deciding, who is devising the laws in that arena. And <clears throat> you're all familiar with the term pivot, right? When I pivot when I have an idea and I need to change it. So this is an example, this is a slide by Pioneer. And Pioneer talks about those devices that we used to have in the past, which, would which we would use to navigate. You know what I'm talking about? It was a device like that that would show you the way you would, when you rented the car, you sometimes you would add a few more euros and get, and get this device. So Pioneer describes the arena for the device where you need to have maps, you need to have uh, probe, probes like gas stations, restaurants, etc., garages. Uh, you compile the map, you have an application that presents it on top of the existing navigation in the vehicle. Now, why, what turned this business model into non-viable? Who killed this model? Waze. Uh, well, but before, Waze, the mobile phone. So, so we all have mobile phones, so why should I have a mobile phone in one pocket with Waze, of course, and, and a pioneer application in another? And also, in, in most cars today, we also have a display. So this is initial viable model, but the model was, was slaughtered. So as a result, they moved to a new model. So the new model says what you see in purple, these are areas that Pioneer wants to invest in, uh, the map, the probe information, and uh, the interface. But the application, they would use a third-party application, say Waze, for instance. And the terminal would be a smartphone terminal or an, a vehicle terminal, etc. So I cannot just come up with a great idea and, and fly with it into the wall. I, I need to, to monitor things that change in the arena and as a result, adapt myself to them. Um, this is an example if I think about, about gyms. Gyms in the United Kingdom, we see that, uh, that uh, there's a 16% decrease in local authority recreation and sports spending, which means that the probability of you going to the, your, 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 uh, the gym in your neighborhood, which, which is funded by the government, is becoming smaller, which means, and as a result, the number of public gyms is declining, which means that there's an opportunity to come up with low-cost gyms. So that's, that's a change in the arena. If we think about mail systems, this is a UPS uh, 
All these slides, by the way, that I show you, these are slides by the CEOs of these companies, part of the presentation to the financial community. So let's assume that you're investing other people's money, and, I, and the UPS CEO wants to convince you to invest in UPS. So what we see here is dramatic change in the mail system, in the sense that we get fewer and fewer letters, and we get more and more, more and more packages, okay? Because we buy all this junk over the internet, so letters become more and more exotic, okay? You don't send so many postcards or, or whatever, and packages become more ubiquitous. And as a result, DHL and UPS, they need to adapt to that. So when, um, when I wanted to draw the arena, the first thing that I needed was an axis, like the north that you see in maps. And the concept that I took uh, apparently is very, very common. So for instance, this slide, again, it's not my slide. It's a si the slide of the CEO of Amec explaining how they make value. So the metaphor is that of a river where you have upstream and you have downstream. And as you flow from top to bottom, more and more value is added to the product. And of course, and at the bottom you have the final, the final consumer. So the final consumer finances all the joy that we see, all the activities that we see in this arena. So if we talk about, about energy, upstream, I generate value by finding oil or gas in the ocean, in the deserts. Midstream, I transport it and I distill it. So I break it into its components. Downstream, I sell you uh, uh, gasoline in the gas station. I sell you gas at home, cooking gas, electricity, and um, plastic products, which are made from, from gasoline. Uh, this is a slide by Toshiba. And Toshiba talks about energy. We see a very similar flow. At the top, you see how the energy is generated. Low carbon thermal power, nuclear power, what have you. And then we transmit it and store it. And finally, we use it. So the flow, again, is top to bottom. And whoever is using electricity is financing all this joy. Um, this is the cocoa arena. Barri Calbo is the world's largest cocoa company. So again, you see the same, the same, uh, the very same concept. At the top, you have cocoa farmers. So they grow, they grow uh, beans. And the Bari Kalbo, which is a giant in this arena, it buys these beans, it processes them, and it generates cocoa powder and cocoa butter, and that's sold to the final, comp final users. And here you see something that's interesting. You, you see the percentages. 54% uh, is the powder, 46% the butter, etc. And the interesting thing is that you need to be creative in this arena. So one option is for you to buy, to actually buy the, the, the say, the, the powder or the butter and make and have vertical integration, which means manufacture everything yourself. Or if I want to have uh, common chocolate, I can have Bari Calbo make the chocolate and package it, and I would just design the wrapping, like a private label, what we see in supermarkets, uh, uh, drugstores, etc. So my involvement can be profound or shallow. We see this, I mean, this is an example from Coco, but we see this with perfume, and, and we'll see it later on. And if we talk about attractiveness, where do I want to be in the arena? We see that some areas are very attractive, like wholesale and retail. That's where they make 24% of the profit, and other areas are less attractive. So I look at this, and I ask myself, where's the money? And can I grab it? Um, this is, for instance, an initiative for African cocoa growers to move uh, into chocolate. So basically, they're talking about what we'll call forward integration, which means I want to grow the beans, and I want to have the brand that also sells it. Uh, we can see this in real estate. So it's very easy to understand it when we talk about physical products. Okay, so I take raw materials and I turn them into products, but this is Remax, which is a real estate uh, uh, agency. And what we see Remax do is basically they take, they take uh, every area and they divide it into re regions and they sell the regions. And then inside every region you have franchises. So a region could be uh, Tel Aviv 
And in Site Tel Aviv, you might have a franchisee in Ramat Aviv, and there I could be a, an agent, and there's a whole business model here which talks about how Remax is getting money from the agents, from the franchisees, and from the independent regions. So, so it's totally relevant to areas which are not physical. Um, so it's, it's very, very obvious when you're thinking about downstream. Downstream is the part from between me and the market. That's what we call go-to-market. So how do I get you to know about me and buy the product? So this is uh, Carlsberg. They make beer, and they sell the beer using two, uh, to the final co consumers using two channels, on-trade. This means you buy the beer in a restaurant or in a bar. Off-trade means you take the beer home and, and you drink it watching World Cup. Um, this is the, the diamond arena. Again, we see the same, the same concept. Upstream, you generate value by, by finding diamonds in Angola, etc. You create more and more value by transporting them, polishing them, and finally you put them inside a, a ring and you sell them to, to a couple getting engaged. Um, and this is another arena where we see dramatic change because historically there was a big diamond cartel called uh, De Beers. And De Beers controlled this arena and, and uh, controlled the prices. And what happened is as more and more diamonds were found in Russia and other countries, uh, in particular a guy named uh, Lev Levayev, he realized that he could dump De Beers. And Lev Levayev has what we call complete vertical integration. So he has his own mines in Angola and he has Leviev stores in Manhattan. So all the value that's generated in this arena is accumulated by Leviev, which is very good for him and his family. So we can see this in, in, in various areas. This is an example of the pharmaceutical industry. This company, Peterson Medical, basically they have 15,000 suppliers that they represent. So each supplier has something like 20 products. This could be uh, Band-Aids, uh, liquids, what have you. And they, they, they take these products to 400,000 potential customers, hospitals, rehab clinics, nursing homes, schools, dealers, etc. So again, the point I'm trying to make is that every single one of these slides uses this metaphor of upstream, downstream, and they were all made by the CEOs of major companies. Okay? So, so, so I'm basically trying to take a concept which is embedded in the conscience of many, many senior industry leaders. So, and this is the milk arena. So again, at top you see uh, raw materials. So I make value by, by growing cows. And of course, on top of me, there could be companies making value by selling me cow feed or, uh, or technology to monitor the cow's health and, and activity, etc. And eventually, again, the final user is financing all this joint. So when we think about the arena, we have basically three objects in the arena. The first object is the market. So uh, we, we use a dotted line to indicate the market. Uh, so the market could be, uh, say, the, um, say the, 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 ret the retail arena. And inside the retail arena, we see firms so we can see players in this arena. So if we think about retail, so we, we, can, we, we can have, um, I don't know, McDonald's and, and Burger King and Pizza Hut, Pizza Hut, etc. So we have a market. And in the market, we have players that compete. And we have regulators. The regulators are, are, are we have seen two types of regulators. One type is government agencies, like the Food and Drug Administration, making sure that you do not sell, you do not actually put cocaine in Coca-Cola, that um, what you do in terms of financial services is, is authorized. Uh, so, so these are the government bodies that supervise trade, healthcare, etc. And the other type is de facto monopoly. So if I want my clicker to, to function on a Windows system, the, regula I mean the, the regulator is Microsoft because many, many, many people are using the Microsoft, oper I mean Microsoft Windows operating system. And if I wanted to recognize my clicker, I need to comply with Microsoft's requirements or with Apple's requirements for the Macintosh. Is it clear? So you have de facto 
regulators, government agencies that say you can do this, you cannot do that. Can I drive autonomous cars? Can I have uh, Uber, etc.? And you have de facto regulators. So if I want to sell you organic food, you would see organizations that would authorize me that my products are actually organic. And this is very important for us if we think about startups, because many of the major startups today are blocked by regulators. If you think about Uber, Uber is not allowed in many countries because taxi drivers uh, are lobbying to the politicians to prevent Uber from operating there. If you think about Airbnb, many cities do not allow people to rent their apartments to Airbnb. This has happened in Berlin, and it's happened all over the world because, because renters say this raises the rental, and so, so they're prevented from doing that. Um, so, so regulator is a very significant tool used by the old rich companies to block the new players. Uh, so this is something very important to monitor. For instance, in Israel, there's a major battle against the fact that when you import things from Alibaba or eBay, you do not pay value-added tax, while products that you buy inside the country, you do pay value-added tax. So it's much more advantageous to buy this shirt from outside of Israel, where you do not pay value-added rather than in Israel. So, so, so regulators are very important to recognize, comply, and use them as a competitive weapon. What are the relationships that we see in the arena? The first relationship is business. Business is a very simple relationship. It basically says, I have a cow, and I, sells, I sell him the milk. He buys the milk, and he makes cheese out of it, and sells her the cheese, and she serves it in her hotel uh, as part of breakfast. So this is very easy, and more and more value is added as we move from the cow all the way to breakfast served in, in the hotel. Um, and, of course, the flow is from top to bottom. Another type of relationship is control. Control is applied by government agencies and by big companies such as Microsoft, Apple, etc. Information. We see two types of information, and which is very important for me if I'm going into this arena, any arena, actually. One type of information is business intelligence. So I need to know what the customers are willing to pay for. I need to know what my competitors are planning to do. So, the, so, so business intelligence is basically want to learn about what you're willing to pay for. So if I'm a discount airline, will you be willing to pay more money, extra money for Wi-Fi in your flight, for a sandwich in your flight, for an extra suitcase, for extra leg room? What are you willing to pay for? Uh, if I think about blah, blah car, uh, sharing, uh, sharing cars, What's worrying you? What's, what's concerned? Are you worried about the fact that you'll get in my car and I'll be a reckless driver? So that's business intelligence. And the second part is called Marco, marketing communication, where I try, having realized what you need, I want to implant into your head the understanding that I'm the product that provides it. I will give you pleasant uh, traffic, uh, pleasant rides, uh, pleasant affordable rides, etc. So the first part of information is getting information about the market, competitors, regulators, and the second is sending it back. So these are, uh, okay. Finally, we see two types of, of relationships in the arena. The first relationship is called vertical integration. Vertical integration is like the example of the diamonds, which means that I'm on two or more levels in the arena. So rather than, so once I sell milk to him and he, he makes cheese, so at one point in time, he might ask himself, why does he need to buy the milk from me? He can grow cows and make his own milk. This is vertical integration because it's on the vertical axis. Okay, I, th this is where I have the cows, and this is where, where he makes the cheese, and this is where she has the, the hotel. And in his case, this was what we call backward integration. The reason we call it backward integration is because we face the customer. So forward integration is when I open an outlet. So for instance, when he asks himself, why do I need to sell her the cheese? I can sell cheese myself, so I can open a roadside uh, stand, or I can open an outlet or what have you. So forward integration, I, I open an activity towards the customer. Backward integration, I want to control my raw materials and my products. So in Lev Levayev's case, backward integration was buying mines in, um, in, in Africa, forward integration, opening diamond jewelry stores in Manhattan. Okay? 
So this is vertical integration. Horizontal integration means that I have a portfolio of products, which gives me power. So, um, so if we look at this, if we look at the supermarket, that's an excellent example of horizontal integration. Because the reason we like a supermarket is that when we go home, we don't want to go to one place and buy milk and go to another, to somebody else and buy vegetables, etc. It's very convenient when you have this vast choice located in one place, and gives the, this gives the supermarket power. And if I sell the supermarket, if I'm Coca-Cola, I'm concerned about, so I'm Coca-Cola, and this is the supermarket chain, I'm concerned that the supermarket is very powerful. So I would also want to have horizontal integration. So typically, a beverage company would sell soft drinks, like Coca-Cola Sprite, mineral water, beer, wine, etc. So they would come up with a broad portfolio which would give them power. If you think about Microsoft, Microsoft has the Microsoft Office suite. The meaning of a suite is horizontal integration. So in the suite you have Word and Excel and Access and PowerPoint and um, what have you. So if I come up with a new word processor, people would tell me why buy your word processor when here in one package I get five products. So having five products gives me a lot of power plus the fact that these products talk very well with each other. Okay, so if I think about Apple having the Macintosh and the iPhone and the iPad, etc., they create a nice uh, horizontal integration because they also work very nicely with each other and with, the, with their website. So we saw vertical integration, which is generated as backward integration. So for instance, if I'm a restaurant, Typically, I buy tomatoes, but if I'm fanatic about tomatoes, backward integration means I grow my own tomatoes. Most restaurants, for instance, buy their ice cream for somebody else. They do not actually make their ice cream. And forward integration might be if I do deliveries or things of the sort. Uh, so let's look at some arenas which are not physical. Uh, this is the tourism arena. The reason it's, it's interesting is because it's a very dramatic, very disruptive arena. Again, this was done by the CEO of a travel port. At the bottom, you always see the, the end user travelers. We travel for business or for leisure. At the top, you have suppliers, airlines, hotels, car rental, uh, tourist cruises. Here you might see large travel agencies who create packages, such as a ski package, which consists of the flight and the ski equipment and the hotel and the, so the lodging and the, and the transportation, etc. And if you think about offline agencies, uh, uh, such as my travel agent, they are really threatened because we use the travel agent less and less. And here we see another phenomenon, which is called jumping the connection or cutting the middleman. Cutting the middleman is what we see in the drug arena, where you import drugs from Colombia, you import cocaine from Colombia, and I distribute it in my neighborhood. And at one point in time, what do I ask myself? I can bring it myself, right? None of you watch Scarface or any movies about drug? I mean, so cutting the middleman is me means basically that I cut the middleman. So if he's the guy bringing the drugs from Colombia, I cut him into tiny pieces and feed my, my fish with, and I go to Colombia myself. Or it's the other way around. He cuts me into little pieces and feeds his turtles with it. So, so the concept of jumping the connection is very, very significant. In tourism, we see it all the time. Because all the discount airlines, they say, we never heard about travel agents. You want to buy a ticket on EasyJet Ryanair, you buy directly from us, jump the connection. <coughs> when you think about... Um, like exactly, Airbnb. Exactly, exactly. So the point is, let's skip, let's skip the middleman. And m many applications in real estate, there's some, some companies that made a lot of money from that. Or you see remediation. So instead of using an offline agent, you use an online agent, like a website. So you might say that Airbnb connects suppliers of apartments with tourists. Uh, we see this with insurance. The whole idea of direct insurance, uh, AIG and other companies, basically says, let's get rid of the insurance agent, and you buy directly from me. And finally, we see it with electronics. Whenever you buy products on the internet, typically what we see is that you have the company that imports electric products saying, I will deliver them directly to your door, and let's skip the electric stores. Uh, so, so this is a very, very strong 
trend in, in this arena. Um, this, is, this is an example of the arena in boats. Again, the seller of the uh, here you see components, and you have boat builders and distributors and dealers, and finally the consumer. So we see, and, and this is horizontal integration. I mean, the fact that Brunswick makes the engine and the boat is not, is not uh, I mean, the engine and the boat, this is horizontal integration. I don't need to make both the boat and the engine. I can make the boat, and I can buy the engine from Mercury or from somebody else. You with me? I don't need to make everything. So if I think about the startup, the decision I need to make, what do I want to do, and what do I want to buy from, from somebody else? Because I could be very good at making the boat, and I could be very mediocre at making the engine or, or some other components. We talked about flow of information, and the first component that we talked about was business intelligence. This is a slide by Barkhard Domke, head of engineering intelligence for Airbus. So if he does intelligence for Airbus, he's spying on. Who's the enemy of Airbus? Boeing. Boeing. So inside his slide, there's a slide by Boeing 787 Dreamliner. And he basically looks for weaknesses in the Boeing offering. And he says, look, the Boeing airplane is, is lacking a window here. So he says, affected passengers may not be happy. So if I want to sell an Airbus to an airline and, and my competitor is Boeing, I might tell them, make sure that your your, your, your your customers are not frustrated by the fact that they buy a window seat and there's no window there. So that's business intelligence. Another aspect which, which was changed dramatically is the marketing communication because it used to be very, very broad. I mean, if you think about ads that we see on television or, or on the roads, they basically, if you see an ad trying to sell me diapers, I'm not yet in the market for dry diapers, okay? So that's a waste of time. So what we see here, this is, this is the new, uh, the concept of a market for advertising. So I get into, into a website for, 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 say, the New York Times, and the New York Times goes on a, on a stock, on a, on, a, on a market and says, I have this guy. They know everything about me from Facebook and, and from, from all the cookies that are, on, that are on my computer. And so there's 150 milliseconds to, to, for somebody to buy an advertising spot for me. So in this case, they say, let's assume this is the guy, this is Coleman, and this is his age, and he's interested in flying to Paris because we've seen that he has cookies from airlines and he's interested, he's looking for flight to, to Paris. So the floor pricing is $1. You want to advertise to this guy, dollar, $1 and up. So we see Denny's offering 33 cents, so, so they're irrelevant, that's under $1. Coca-Cola offering $1.5, so they're in the game. This might be a pornography or a gambling website, so I don't want to have them on, my, on, on the New York Times. eBay offers 132, and Skype is irrelevant, and this website is not interested in advertising to me. So the winner is Coca-Cola. Now, all of this runs in 150 milliseconds, and the beautiful thing here is that Coca-Cola does not pay the price that it offered. It pays the next highest price, and the beauty here, what's worrying me when I'm, when I'm bidding and I don't know what you guys are bidding. What am I worried about? Paying too much. Exactly. I priced it too high. So I'm, I'm worried about the fact that I would bid at, uh, $5 and he would only bid a dollar and a half. And so I turned out to be an idiot. So they say, no problem. Go as high as you want because you would pay his price. But at the same time, he realizes that. So he also ups his price. So as a result, we're all very, very uh, happy to raise our prices and eventually the... So it's a beautiful application of game theory. Um, this is another variation on the point of marketing communication. This is a company that sells strollers and car seats. And what one of the... Inter so, so this is how they get to the market. And one of the interesting things is they focus on baby shops and e-commerce. And it turns out that a big thing in China is this thing called... Uh, Weibo, which are uh, sh small movies. Here, here you can see there's an example of, of tiny online micro movies. So as people get in the train and they drive to work, they watch this tiny movie. So inside this tiny movie, I can advertise. You, you, you know this concept where, where we do product placement? So I pay for the, I mean, this couple is obviously in love, which means that in two seconds they have a baby, and they will put the baby in, in a stroller 
uh, that, that's made by us. So, so, so that's another concept that we've not seen in the past. And here we need creativity. This is a slide by Dropbox. And Dropbox, the problem was how to get to market. So what they did is they advertised on Google with AdWords. And this is the final analysis. And they say the cost per acquisition is between $233 and $388. You're with me? So in order to get him to, to, to pay, actually, for Dropbox, I pay, say, $240. But, but the product only costs him $100. So it's, me, it, it's as if I were to send him $300. So this model is not viable. So for every customer, if I'm paying extra $300, I'm going to go bankrupt. So this model of moving from Dropbox to the final user using Google does not work. So what was their solution? Their solution was bring a friend. I don't know if you remember that, but most of us, I think, joined Dropbox by somebody recommending Dropbox to us in return of getting more memory. You don't remember that? So basically, I joined Dropbox because a student told me it was a great application. And as a result, he got, I don't know, a few, a few uh, megabytes of memory. And I recommended it to other people. So, so this is a brilliant solution in the sense that it says, how do I get to you guys? Using, you, using Google is, is, is not viable. So I need to find another channel to reach you. This is Groupon. It's similar. Again, they say, this is the marketplace. How do I get consumers? To, to reach me and, and um. so I would conclude with the mobile phone arena just so that we understand how many options are available in this arena. That it's not something deterministic where everybody does the same thing, but actually creativity is the thing. So he, I, I would just compare iPhone and Samsung. Again, in the arena, you don't see one player. You see a bunch of players. So. If we think about the processor, here we see a difference because Samsung manufactures its own processor. This is what we call backward integration, while Apple buys the processor from Samsung. So this is a market relationship. This is backward integration. If we think about assembling the phone, Samsung assembles its own phones, while Apple uses Foxconn. Foxconn is a Chinese company that assembles uh, iPhones in China. Because so, so, so this is another example where Samsung has backward integration, assembling its own product, Apple paying somebody to do it for them. If we think operating systems, it's the opposite. Because Apple actually owns its own operating system, the iOS, while Samsung is one of a multitude of companies using Android. So here we have at Apple backward integration while Samsung is using Android. Um, when when Google wanted to launch its own phone, because Google has no experience in manufacturing phones, they basically had LG manufacture a phone for them. And then Motorola went, by, went on the market. So Google bought Motorola and bought its patents and sold them out. Um, and then, of course, so these are the operating systems we all know. But Windows, Microsoft was very frustrated with the fact that none of us basically are using Windows Mobile. So to try to force us to use Windows Mobile, Windows did forward, uh, Microsoft did forward integration and bought Nokia. Because Nokia, you remember, when Nokia was a huge player. And the idea was that Nokia is such a big player, so we'll buy a Nokia phone and we'll automatically have Windows Mobile on it. But the result was just that Nokia died with it. But this is an example of looking at the world in a creative way and trying to find opportunities and risks uh, either way. If we look at the go-to market, the only of these companies that actually has a brick and mortar store is, is Apple, because Apple has these Apple stores all over the world. And as a result, uh, what originally what Microsoft and Samsung did, they went to Best Buy and they opened a store within a store. So this is an example where Samsung plans mini stores inside Best Buy, and this is where Microsoft opens uh, stores within Best Buy, Dixons, etc. It's also dramatic if you develop an application, because historically, when people would buy the application in a computer store, the bottleneck was the computer store. The computer store could only have less than 1% of the games that came on the market. So when you went with your grandparents to buy a game, there was only a percent. So the store collected 80% of the value you paid. Because if I'm the bottleneck, I keep 80% of the money. Then mobile companies took over, 
So they could have one or two products and they took half of the money. Well, today, if you think about the App Store or, or Android market, they only take 30%. So for application developers, it's become, it becomes much and much and more attractive because you can have as many products and the margins are smaller, et cetera. So um, if I conclude what I was trying to say, you want to move into a market, you need to learn the market. You need to understand the dynamics of the market, and that's a very inter interesting thing. Areas that were very profitable in the past, such as PCs. Intel, uh, Intel made a lot of money from PC processes. PCs are in stagnation, and mobile phones are now uh, high. And mobile phone, and in the future, uh, Internet of Things is going to grow. So imagine a landscape that's, that's very, very dynamic. Things that were attractive become unattractive, etc. And so you need to understand it. And when you want to go into a market, you want to decide what you want to do in terms of vertical integration and horizontal integration. And sometimes um, uh, just being in an arena that's very dynamic, I would conclude with just this example, uh, can be very profitable. This is an example from students of mine. They developed an application, a cyber application for automobiles. So, what, so basically they came from the cyber arena, from uh, Shmone Matai. And uh, they realize that today's cars are very uh, electric, so there are many components that communicate by wireless, which means that it's a lot of fun if I can, uh, uh, where can we see this? Uh, this is an example of how much fun it can be if I take over your car and I uh, drive you into a truck. If I take over your car and I turn your engine off in the middle of the highway. So there are many, many fun things that I can do if I can take over your car. So, and oddly enough, Argus, that's the name of, of, of the startup, they realized that there is a threat and they knew the technology and they learned the arena. And uh, this is like by Valeo. Valeo is a player. So you see many, many companies playing in this arena. Um, and the beautiful thing was that Argus, basically uh, marketing uh, protection for the automobiles, they managed to create a, pri a bidding war. So there was a bidding uh, war for Argus by Bosch, uh, Continental, Magna, and Delphi. And finally, Continental acquired them for $450 million, which basically ruined their lives because if you're kids and you have $450 million, you have nothing left to live for. So good luck to you.